Awesome. Thanks, Victoria. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, this post lunch scene um, might be might be rough. Um, I hope you're all still engaged from uh, the morning's session. Um, I'll have some slides to share with you uh, and a lot of questions about uh, mostly focused on Grammarly, although I think a lot of the things that uh, I want to talk about cross over into a number of areas. If you've talked to me at all about academic integrity and AI tools, you know um, that there are lots of offshoots I'm willing to go down. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen with you. Um, you can feel free to put questions in the chat. I'll try to keep my eye on things. Um, and I'll try to answer questions as they come up if they're relevant, or I might wait till uh, the end, but I definitely will be keeping track of all the questions that you might have. Um, so the title of this presentation is taken from uh, the tagline for Grammarly. It's one of their promo uh, statements, personalized AI everywhere you write. Um, and I think, um, uh, Jesse Breen in an earlier session uh, about panicking, about not panicking about AI, <laughs> uh, uh, described uh, the way uh, th the most common AI tools are used as sort of more like Wally. -E, and I was sort of like, oh, that's kind of what my slide, the robot in my slides look like. So, uh, so I thought that was an interesting um, connection. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Allison Thomas. Uh, my my current role is, is the assistant dean for academic integrity. Our office opened this summer uh, and is the first sort of centralized uh, academic integrity outfit on campus. Um, I've worked with academic integrity since 2015 uh, and I've been at AU since 2005. I teach in the writing program, I teach in the literature department uh, and in the American studies program. Um, if you would just take a second and uh, put in the chat a number that you think represents what you feel like you know about Grammarly. So a number from one to 10, one being what is Grammarly? I have no idea what Grammarly is. 10 being I know quite a lot about Grammarly. So if you could just kind of self-report um, what, you, what you know. Thanks y'all. Great, we have, you can keep throwing them in there if you haven't gotten to it, this is great. So we have a nice variety. There's some of you who I think have uh, have some expertise and some of you for whom this conversation might pose some, uh, some new uh, questions, challenges, and information. So uh, I'm glad for that. Thank you. Um, I will let you know first that I used uh, AI tools to make these slides. Um, I used Canva's designer. So like the PowerPoint designer, Canva has uh, lots of options for users to help design slide layout, the use of templates. Um, e even some of the templates have uh, uh, relevant text um, for people to use if they want to. And then I may also made a point of using Grammarly's assistant tool a few times in my slides. Uh, and I've tried to note that or maybe try to trick you a little bit and you'll see that later on. Um, but this comment bubble gives you a sense of my inner monologue in, in doing all this. Uh, in, in my head, I'm thinking, is this okay? How is my audience going to feel about my use of Grammarly in this context? Will my audience trust me if they know that some of the language I'm using is being edited by Grammarly? And I think those are some questions that I'll, I'll come back to or that should come up for you again. Um, and if you wanted to know, uh, if I asked a robot to edit that previous text, so the text is on the previous slide, uh, I put it into Grammarly and I asked Grammarly to improve it. Um, so you can kind of see it lengthened uh, my statements. It went from these pieces to this one giant paragraph. Uh, it used some longer words um, and uh, it, um, it added some concern, which I'm not sure I feel concerned. I was really just curious. Um, and so I thought this is an interesting uh, use of, of the tool to show you sort of right away. In terms of our goals for this session, um, I'd like to tell you a bit more about how Grammarly works so that you can assess what you see as the benefits or shortcomings for your own purposes, whether that's um, personal, professional, or in the classroom. Certainly I'll be most focused on work in the classroom, but I think uh, the use of Grammarly and generative AI tools like it are permeating uh, our, our cultures of higher education, but also workplace cultures. Um, 
So uh, I also want to help you think about how you might articulate uh, how you how you see Grammarly and other tools being useful or not useful in your class. So language for a syllabus, language for an assignment um, to help you give specific guidelines for responsible use. Um, and then thinking through sort of some approaches for how you might teach responsible use with the knowledge that telling students something isn't the same as teaching something. So saying in a syllabus, it's okay to use generative AI tools, or it's not okay to use generative AI tools might not quite be specific enough. Um, and I think uh, that gets at some of the reasons why Grammarly is the kind of focal point uh, for me today. I do want to recognize that um, our colleague Christina Damian has done uh, a great um, uh, session earlier this fall on not just Grammarly, uh, but other generative AI tools. Uh, Grammarly was part of it and she did a great uh, demo. Um, and, and I wanna use that also to recognize that I'm not an expert in Grammarly. Uh, I'm not an expert in generative AI tools, although I know a, a good amount about them at this point. Um, I would say I'm a student of this. Uh, and my particular slice of expertise is really in academic integrity and how some of these tools um, really uh, force us to think differently about how we talk about academic integrity and how we make policies about academic integrity. So my slice here is really sort of concerned with some of the, um, the, the ways these tools may or may not corrupt some of our, um, our, our learning goals. So I'll tell you a little bit about what Grammarly is and how it works. So for those of you who are closer to the one end of the spectrum in terms of knowledge, uh, I'll give you as much information as I can and point you to some resources that you can look into. Um, I'll show you a little bit about uh, kind of what it looks like. Um, I'd like us to talk through some of the, the benefits and the concerns we see once we've looked at some of the tools that are offered. Um, spend some time talking about how we can articulate guidelines for students that are specific. Um, and then there's always the question of what of what can go wrong. Uh, I think it's important to consider that in advance so that we can be proactive in making sure that um, if, if we are letting uh, students use particular tools that we're helping them use them responsibly. So Grammarly is a tool that uh, came into the public sphere in 2009. Uh, so it's been around for a really long time. Um, and it is, really uh, start, it started as a tool that was identifying grammatical errors. So really not all that different from spell check or grammar checks that we might see on Microsoft Word. And it grew from there, obviously right away, it started using technologies to become more and more specific. Um, especially when it first started, it was a tool that was being recommended to, uh, um, to students who struggled with dyslexia, for example. Um, our Academic Support and Access Center um, often recommended it to students with different learning styles or abilities, um, and, uh, and that was pretty common. Um, for multilingual writer students, multilingual students, um, this was, it was also a tool that some faculty um, were uh, requiring. So there's definitely some assumptions about who uses Grammarly, um, that it's a tool suited to multilingual writers who um, certainly might find appeal in getting it right when it comes to grammar. Um, like I said, some faculty, especially uh, in the early days of Grammarly, were requiring students to use it. Um, students with learning disabilities um, might, might be encouraged to use Grammarly, especially again in the, in, in the early days. Um, for online students who, who want uh, digital access to support services um, and, uh, and can't get to campus or can't uh, get to campus during the hours uh, that our support services were here, uh, Grammarly was a sort of uh, appealing option. But I think these assumptions, um, I, would, I would correct these now for the moment. And I would say everyone uses Grammarly. Um, every kind of student, every, every background of student, um, students with all kinds of uh, abilities every class year. Um, there's, it's, it's across the board, a universal tool. Um, and so in terms of why Grammarly, uh, and I'll, I'll put that up on a slide in a second, um, that's definitely one of the reasons. It's pervasive. A lot of students are using it. The new Grammarly, um, what it sort of evolved into offers a kind of um, AI powered um, assistant tool. Um, it promises to give consistent real-time feedback. Um, 
It uh, not only promises to polish grammar, uh, but it also um, says it can help with tone, clarity, um, team consistency. So it's orienting itself also not just or not just to academic spaces, but to the workplace where people might be working in teams to create uh, shared documents. Um, sometimes this happens in the classroom as well. Um, it promises to help students accelerate uh, their writing process. Um, it champions their voice, it says, um, and spurs academic or professional growth. So these are all um, quotes from Grammarly's um, sort of promotional materials. I think I've kind of gotten a little bit at this sort of why Grammarly above any other specific AI tool that we could have a session about. Certainly there's a place and I, I've talked to so many faculty who say things like, oh my goodness, there's so many AI tools. How can I possibly learn about all of them? They all do different things. They operate in different ways. If I'm really gonna give students clear guidance, uh, how can I possibly understand the encyclopedia of uh, of these generative uh, AI tools that are out there. On the screen right now are some of the most common AI tools, generative AI tools that I see students using in the context of my academic integrity work. So that means I see students often misusing these tools. Um, ChatGPT, obviously the most common that most people have heard of, Dolly probably also very common, um, involves images. Quillbot is a really popular uh, paraphrasing and summarizing tool. Slides Go helps make presentations. Um, Janae does um, a lot of different things, but, but Summary is probably it, it's, its most um, lauded um, capacity. Jasper, same thing. Uh, site is for scientific research gathering, illicit for research gathering. Uh, I was just in a meeting yesterday where Otter AI uh, was powering a virtual assistant who was attending a meeting for someone. Uh, and so they were basically creating a transcript uh, of the of the meeting for the person. Um, tutor AI uh, purports to be a tutor for students, and I'll come back to this language um, in a few minutes. Um, but Grammarly, in contrast to all of these, um, has a history, and so the fact that it it's developed, it's evolved, um, creates I think this issue. Um, that we may hear the word Grammarly and we're thinking, oh, cool, you can get help with your grammar or it will make suggestions to you about um, your subject verb agreement. And it's, that's true. It can do that. It still does that. Um, but it now has a lot more capabilities than it used to. So if you as a faculty member are saying to students, sure, go ahead and use Grammarly, uh, I think it's, it's important that we know what we mean or we know what we're saying when we say that. So um, students' ideas about Grammarly are really different than faculty ideas by and large. I think a lot of faculty don't really know uh, how some of the capacities for this tool uh, have changed. So how does it work? Um, when you create an account uh, with Grammarly, you add you can add it uh, as a plugin to your Google Docs. You can add it to um, you can give it access to your desktop computer so that it has access to all the things you do. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, I've had it on my desktop um, for the past few days, and I can't wait to get rid of it. I don't I don't like it. <laughs> um, uh, so I'll show you and you can kind of think about that. Um, it's, it's used, if you're thinking about employing Grammarly in some way in your class, if you're thinking about asking students to use it or even requiring students to use it, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, you'll need to kind of get a sense of what's, of what's going on with it. If you don't wanna download it, if you don't want it on your computer, there's a lot of different ways you can sort of integrate it into your, um, into your systems. Um, so you can take a look at the different varieties, um, but they do have a lot of demos that you can watch. So if you wanna see what it looks like, I mean, I'll show you um, and I'll show you some of those demos, but um, you should be able to get a good sense of how it works by looking at some of the demos too. So if you wanted to look at a particular capacity that I don't talk about today, um, the, the demos should definitely give you a good idea. Um, like I said, it can run in a lot of different ways. You can put it on Chrome. You, I put it on my Mac. You can see here. Um, you can put it on your on your iPhone. Um, and so it can come into all your tools. So here's an example of of me writing an email. Uh, and 
this little guy at the bottom of the screen, the little uh, kind of green light bulb that I've circled here um, is everywhere. So every time I open a Word document, every time I open an email, it comes up unless I disable it. Um, and so the green light bulb is a reminder like, hey, we've got some suggestions for you. Do you want, do you want to know what they are? Uh, and so when I click on it, in this case, uh, the tool recognized that I was writing a kind of uh, an email to a community. It thinks I'm writing a company update uh, and it's giving me specific suggestions for things that I might include. I can also ask it for more help. As you see in the box there, I can type something in response to that question, what's the update about? And it will give me more. There's also a little tool at the top um, where it says formal. Uh, if I clicked on that, it would give me a lot of other options for tone that I could use. And it's not just formal tone or informal tone in this, in this iteration. There are lots of other options for tone that I can use here. Um, some of the tone examples, and I'll show you more, um, include make it sound more confident, uh, make it more direct. Uh, make it more casual. So there's a lot more nuance to the ways the tool is working with tone. I took some screenshots of this because uh, I wanted to be able to have these in the slides so that when I share them, they're here instead of having to watch a, a video of the demo. Um, but basically what's happening here is I'm showing you on this side, this is the Grammarly menu that comes up when I click that little green um, light bulb in my Microsoft Word as I'm writing. Um, and so it can do, this is just an example of some of the things it can do. Um, it can and acknowledge, it can acknowledge itself, which is really helpful. Uh, if you're gonna have students use these tools, using this to say, this is how I'm using generative AI. It can draft an outline. It can give a research plan. It can suggest counter arguments, cuts. It can brainstorm topics. It can identify gaps, right? These are all of them. This is only part of the menu of options that Grammarly offers when you click that little green light bulb. So the other thing you see on the screen here is an example of an assignment. So let's say a student gets this assignment to choose a specific item from popular culture, make an argument written for scholars in a specific field of study about its value. When, uh, it, let's say the student pastes that into their Word document, opens up their green light bulb and chooses brainstorm. I want help brainstorming topics. This is what Grammarly gave me when I did that. So it's giving me six ideas that uh, respond to the prompt, the prompt. So it's worth thinking about for your own work as an instructor, would it be okay if a student did this in your class? Uh, if you gave them a prompt and they used this tool to brainstorm in this way. Maybe it depends on what they do with the list they get. So for example, if the student gets this list of six topics and then picks one and submits it as their own, is that the same, is that okay? Is that not okay? Um, on the next screen, I'll show you another way. So let's say that the student got that list of brainstormed ideas and they didn't want to choose one. They didn't like any of those, but seeing the list of examples helped them really get a handle on what the prompt was asking for. And they thought, you know what? I don't want any of those topics, but that makes me see that the movie Barbie is actually uh, an, a topic I could choose. So seeing those examples kind of kickstarted my thinking. And now I think I want to write about uh, the movie Barbie as an influence on adolescence. Um, and so now I go back to my green light bulb in, uh, in Grammarly and I choose give me ideas for improvement. And so the Grammarly tool produces this a representation of diverse cultures and ethnicities in Barbie movies and the implications for adolescent viewers. So it's not, it's, it's really added something else, right? This idea of diverse cultures and ethnicities wasn't in the original idea. It's creating something else uh, and adding something else to it. And so this is something to think about. Uh, what if students have come up with this topic by looking at the brainstormed ideas and then this is the improvement that Grammarly suggests. Would this be okay? 
Um, so knowing that these are the capacities, these are some of the capacities that Grammarly has, I think should allow you to give more specific guidelines about what is and isn't okay. Um, here's another, here's another step in the process. So let's say the student uh, takes that improved, quote, improved idea, the representation of diverse cultures and ethnicities in Barbie movies. Also Barbie movies I, um, is an interesting addition it's made as well. Uh, and, and says, yeah, that is improved. I like that. I'm going to go with that. That's my topic. And then they click their green light bulb and they select, give me a research plan. Now the tool produces this list of seven things. And I'm guessing we have uh, some librarians in the house that, uh, and, and, and researchers ourselves all who might say, I don't know if that's a research process that I would like for students to go go through. I don't know if that emphasizes some of the information literacy um, skills and concepts that I want my students to learn and practice. Um, but what would what would um, would it be okay if a student decided to sort of start following some of this research plan? What if they started to use this as a map? What if they presented it as their own as part of a process in your class? So again, I think knowing that the tool has this capacity allows you to give really specific guidelines to students about what they can and can't do. Certainly the capacities this, this tool has go even beyond that. And uh, you'll see that I introduced to you in a minute, uh, Zach, who is uh, the, the face of a new series that Grammarly has across social media platforms. So Zach is on TikTok, Zach is on Snapchat, Zach is on YouTube. Um, and he's got a whole series on using AI as a student. Um, and so he's got a video on paraphrasing. He's got a video on using the Grammarly AI tool to get instant feedback on your work. Um, certainly students are using Grammarly in, uh, for professional reasons, to write a cover letter, to write a resume. Um, and in professional spaces, Grammarly is also being used. Um, and we've actually seen a lot of situations this fall semester from uh, graduate students who are taking courses at AU and working in professional spaces where they're expected to use tools like Grammarly uh, in, a, in a fluent um, way. And so that presents its own set of complications. So just to summarize some of the AI-powered assistance that Grammarly is providing, it can do brainstorming things. It can provide, it could, meaning it's generating a list of ideas based on a topic, a word, or a sentence. Um, it can summarize things. It can shorten. It can lengthen text that um, a user puts in. It can identify a main point. Uh, one of its main, uh, one of its menu items is TLDR, too long, didn't read, um, which is a, a web speak way of asking it to shorten what you've created. Um, it can add detail and description. Um, it's relevant to think about where that detail and description comes from if it's not in the text that the students created. Um, and it can change the tone. Examples include more confident, more casual, more empathetic, which I thought was a really, uh, really interesting uh, offering from, from, the, from the digi a digital tool to be more empathetic um, and more direct. And of course, I think this has been discussed um, in a few other sessions today. And so I'm grateful for the questions about um, and for the comments about accessibility, um, that not all generative AI tools are free. In fact, uh, many of them and many of the, uh, the most high powered, powerful versions are, are paid tools. Um, the version that I'm showing you, uh, I downloaded it and I'm using the, the free version. I did not level up with premium and I don't intend to. Um, I've read about what premium services offer, um, and by and large, it's more, um, more um, suggestions, uh, more, uh, the, the plagiarism detection service that it promises is a big part of the, the premium offering. Um, and uh, I don't know if others have had experience with the premium tool, but the students that I've talked to are mostly using the free version um, most students who, who say they've liked using Grammarly are using, are using the free version and feel like they're getting something out of it. Although that's something um, is 
is huge. There's a huge variety among students about what that means. So I'll come back to Zach um, and I'll just let you uh, meet him really quickly uh, because I think this will introduce some uh, some interesting topics of conversation amongst, amongst us. Um, hopefully this will play, but I have a backup plan just in case. Sometimes the hardest part about a writing assignment is getting started. Staring at a blank page, waiting for inspiration to strike, finding a topic, structuring an outline. I'm Zach, and I'm here to show you how to use AI to jumpstart your writing process and get words onto the page faster. I'll use Grammarly to illustrate how AI can be your brainstorming thought partner at the beginning stages of your assignment. Let's say I'm working on an important paper and don't know where to start. Grammarly can suggest personalized ideas to kickstart my paper. Let me show you how. First, I enter some basic information about my paper into a doc. Then I click the Grammarly icon and select brainstorm topics for my assignment. Grammarly generates a list of potential paper topics in seconds. Think about how much time I just saved getting to a relevant list of ideas. I can then copy and paste these ideas into my doc to explore more later or choose one to move forward with right now. And Grammarly doesn't stop at just brainstorming topics. I can also use it to form a research plan to help me navigate the information gathering process. To do this, I select, give me a research plan. Grammarly provides me with a blueprint tailored to my topics to streamline my research. I can then add the research plan into my doc. Once I've completed my research, Grammarly can even help me draft an outline for my paper so I have a clear, structured path forward in my writing process. And there you have it. Grammarly and AI assistants can help you discover new, exciting directions for your work, saving you time with brainstorming ideas, generating research plans, structuring outlines, and more, so you can submit your best work. Make sure you download Grammarly for AI writing assistance and subscribe to this channel for tips on up-leveling your communication with AI. Thanks for watching, now go write. So I'm just curious, um, obviously Zach uh, is showing some of the same stuff that I've already uh, taken, you know, shown you the screenshots of, but I did want you to see kind of uh, his charismatic, uh, kind of uh, promotional material. And I, I guess I'm sort of wondering, and you can put this in the chat or, or shout it out, if anything uh, stuck out to you about uh, Zach's promo video, any red flags, any um, any excitement, any uh, sort of offerings that were super interesting to hear. Oh, hi, Kelly, yeah. Hi, Allison. Um, after your presentation, so so the way that Zach puts it, it seems um, like it sort of sucks all of the student creativity out of it. It seems like Zach is implying that Grammarly is doing all the work um, so that the student doesn't have to do a lot of thinking. Obviously, they're going to have to do some thinking later, but they haven't done the really interesting, exciting, what if kind of stuff, um, which is troubling. Yeah, thanks. I see in the chat, Betsy said uh, it's about saving time. Yeah, and uh, earlier, uh, Betsy's session featured some students. I think your student, Josh, Betsy, talked about the struggle being part of uh, the learning process. And it seems like uh, Zach wants to take the struggle out. Um, Angela says he's focusing on helping you on partnership, this idea of it being yours. He's really fixated on this still being yours. Um, Piper says saying that it can help with your work. Um, it, it seems like there's a disconnect there about how we think about a student's own work and a student's voice um, and what Zach is is really promise is really promising. Yeah, Rebecca says it's completely skirts over any question of ethical issues about doing those pre-writing steps. It makes it seem like this is going to be okay. Responsible is a work that I've I've watched a lot of Zach, believe me. And Zach talks about responsibility quite a lot. It's like someone keeps putting up a cue card in front of you know in front of Zach, being like mention responsible again, um, just to make sure. Um, Karan says uh, the main selling point here is efficiency. Um, think about how much time you've just uh, you've just saved. 
Um, there's no discussion about cutting and pasting. Yeah, uh, the staff, my, my office staff and I watched some of these videos together. Um, and we thought about making a video of us watching the video because um, uh, in the middle of his, we'd be like, no, no, please don't copy and paste. Um, and uh, rushing the process, yeah, Jody, rushing the process might actually cause more stress for students rather than encouraging them to relax. That's an interesting point. Um, I think maybe we'll start a, a YouTube channel of our own that's like counter programming to Zach, Angela, thanks. <laughs> um, I, uh, I picked out a lot of the same, uh, yeah, Olivia, transactional is so huge. Um, and, and even when we think about uh, the ways students can learn about research at, um, at, as transactional, like I need to go get this source. Um, it's a similar kind of, kind of vibe. Um, the focus on results, the focus on speed, the focus on um, uh, productivity, and the, the, the metric of success is definitely uh, sort of grades focused um, in, in, Zach's, um, in Zach's formulation. I do also want to mention, um, and I think this kind of came out for us a little bit, the use of assistant and partner is something we're seeing in a lot of generative AI tools right now. And to that, I would also add the term tutor. Um, and so I've talked about this a bit with uh, Karan, you and I have talked about this quite a lot um, and the, the COGOD um, ProComs staff, uh, the uh, Nisha Ann Green in the Writing Center uh, and uh, academic support. Um, we've talked about this a lot. Um, what happens when students start seeing these tools as as tutors, what's what's what are we doing to the um, the services that we offer? Um, how are we valuing sort of the human components of of real tutoring? Um, and so that's something I think it's important for us to look out for and to and to sort of think through language wise. Um, I feel uncomfortable with the language of of this tool as a partner or as an assistant or as a tutor, um, because I worry about um, some of the very human services we offer. Um, to, to that extent. I also think a lot of students have talked about um, the tendency to rely on digital tools because it feels easier. Like I'm sitting in my chair at home right now. Uh, I'm going to continue sitting in my chair at home while I get help instead of um, getting up and going to the writing center or going to academic coaching and interacting with a person uh, live. I think uh, earlier uh, Bridget Trogdon mentioned um, population P, um, the, uh, the, the age of students that's kind of been uh, educated in high school during, during the pandemic and some of the social skills and social advocacy um, that is maybe missing from some of those learning experiences during that era. Certainly, I can't say that Grammarly has no benefits, and I don't want to take away from faculty who are thinking about using these tools in meaningful or creative ways. Um, and so I think uh, sometimes getting suggestions for correctness, punctuation, and syntax is really useful. Um, I think uh, uh, the notion that there are suggestions, these really are, so you don't have to accept anything. Um, it's not sort of coming in and taking over your work. Um, certainly students don't always see them as suggestions and don't always use them that way, but with guidance, uh, they, they might, and then use those suggestions to sort of navigate, should I accept, should I reject, why should I accept? Why should I reject? Um, for form-driven writing, I mean, um, tools like Grammarly uh, and, and sort of generative AI tools that um, are specific to really formulaic writing, I'm thinking like um, co our colleagues in the law school who work with legal contracts have been using tools like this um, for a while. Um, so for standard forms and genres, this kind of templatizing um, can be helpful. Uh, working with citations, what Grammarly does with citations isn't all that different than what other sort of citation generator tools um, can do, although it has some other capacities that um, students would, would want to be aware of before trusting them completely, like any citation generator. Um, in professional contexts, like I said, there are professional spaces that are requiring students use these tools, um, professional uh, workstations that are coming with uh, these tools um, enabled. Um, for crafting emails, um, for some people, crafting an email is a, 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 a huge challenge. 
Um, this, this might be an appropriate tool to kind of think through what an email should look like, um, working on resumes and cover letters. Uh, again, I, I think some of the same questions about how to use this as pre-professional or professional um, do remind us of some of the central questions. I'll bring these up again in, a, in another slide. Um, but questions about audience awareness um, and purpose and intention. So these remind you maybe of some of the questions that came from the internal monologue I gave you at the beginning of the presentation, um, which is, uh, is my audience expecting that the work is completely generated by me? Uh, is there value to human generated work for this particular project? Um, does doing this project with machine assistance help me achieve my goal? Or does using machine assistance actually uh, hinder me from reaching my goal? And so I think those are questions that are, are guiding lights, uh, not just for academic spaces, but for other contexts as well. Um, if you're applying for a job that's, um, that involves a lot, of, a lot of writing and you wanna use your writing to show your personality, um, then maybe using, using machine assistance is gonna get, get in the way of your objective, right? And so I think encouraging students to think critically about those sort of audience questions um, is, is really helpful and important. Certainly the concerns that we've all mentioned have, uh, are, are, are real. Um, there's questions of equity, who gets to create and who has access to technology. Some students are gonna pay for the, um, for the premium versions of these tools. Um, will that make them uh, uh, put them at an advantage over their peers? Uh, I think it's still too early to know and certainly on, on a broad level too early to know. Um, and yeah, Betsy, I'm just seeing your comment. How do, how do faculty fairly evaluate two assignments when, when one is using a tool and the other is not, or one is using a free tool and the other is using a paid tool? Um, issues of privacy come up with all generative AI tools. What, what happens when your, your work uh, enters into a, a mass um, swath of data, um, when you allow tools access to um, to material. All of these tools have um, kind of privacy, privacy agreements, terms and conditions um, that, that our students certainly um, are, are not likely to read. The environmental dis, uh, impact of, of generative AI, I think is often overlooked that um, these are tools that rely on making patterns uh, that, they're, that they learn from uh, consuming mass amounts of data. And mass amounts of data require environmental um, kind of structures to service. Um, there are issues of heating and of cooling um, in, in response to the heat created by that amount of data. More data together creates um, uh, some environmental impact that I don't think, I think our students, um, when they learn about that, really care about it. But I don't know that that's um, something that we talk a whole lot about. Um, the ethical question, certainly I find that students want to talk about this quite a lot. Um, and that relates to the questions of, of authenticity and substitution for me. Um, is, this, is this a shortcut or a substitution for work that we're asking students to learn? Um, we have determined as instructors or as guides to students in a learning process that this work is required to help you learn the things I'm promising to help you learn. And if you shortcut that work or you create substitutions for that work, you won't learn. Many students uh, recognize that, um, but, but if students don't have that, um, the, the motivation we can offer with more detail about what we're doing and why, um, then the likelihood to look for a substitution or shortcut is way higher. Um, the complication of help really, I, I've, I've had this question in the front of my mind for a long time. I think the help ecosystem uh, across the internet is really complicated. There are lots of things that, that like Zach, uh, market themselves as help. Students don't always have the literacy skills to know this isn't exactly help or this isn't helping me do the thing I really actually need help with, given the context that I'm in. Um, and then certainly issues of misuse that come from uh, perhaps a failure to attribute. And like I said, Grammarly has tools for acknowledging its own use that you can, you can just click the button and it'll create a, a citation. It'll create um, a description of how the, what prompts were used and how. 
um, but not all students do that. Not, not all of us are giving guidance for that. Um, I mentioned this issue, um, but I wanna, but I wanna kind of highlight it, I think, because I do think this is something that we're gonna need to keep talking about. And, and as faculty keep um, emphasizing for our students, some of the differences between the kind of like quote help that they might find outside of AU um, and in digital spaces and the kind of help um, that's, that's available uh, uh, through human services um, at, at AU. Um, Karan, I think this is a good question. It, help or a good point, help for gathering information versus help for student learning. And it reminds us that um, I was in a, I Betsy, I think you were there at, I was in a webinar yesterday and uh, he was the president of Wesleyan University talked about um, th this notion that if we're asking a question that can be answered uh, by a machine, uh, maybe it's not a question we should be asking in the first place. Um, and I think that's there's that's a little reductive, but I do think it offers us something to think about as teachers that are trying to revise and think through how these the advent of these tools, um, the prevalence of these tools might impact our teaching. How do I need to revise my question? What am I really asking for? What do I really want students to do? Um, and and uh, this speaker um, said, oftentimes what we want to what we want is to see students thinking. We don't necessarily want to see the product of the thinking. We want to see the process of the thinking, right? Um, and so emphasizing that and zeroing in on that um, might help us uh, kind of navigate some of these tools. So I'm wondering if there are any of the capabilities of Grammarly that you've seen today or that you've seen in your own travels um, that might be useful in your course, how you work with students, um, which components you might consider allowing or advising students to use and why, and which components would you say, I don't wanna permit the use of those tools and what would you say about why not? Um, and then this last question I think is the most important, which is um, what do you think you need to tell students who might wanna use this tool? Um, because I think that opens the door to uh, more, more work, which is how do I then sort of teach to this? Um, so I was hoping we could uh, do some random breakout groups for um, about, uh, let's do about 10 minutes. Um, Victoria or Mary Catherine, are you able to help me create uh, random uh, breakout groups? And I can put these questions in the chat so that, um, I think they'll cross over into the breakout spaces. Alrighty, how many breakout rooms would you like? Um, let's see. There's. Let's do. Let's. Let's do. Seven. Okay. About that. And do you want to be included in them? Uh, sure. There you go. Thank you. Oh, darn it. I went to hit enter for a chat thing, and I think I got sent back to the main room, unless you're gathering us all. I don't know how to get back to my room. I don't know what I was in. Um, We are closing it right now, though. Then I won't worry about it. Thanks. <laughs> no worries.
unmute. Welcome back as you're returning. Thanks everybody uh, for taking a minute to sort of talk that through. Um, I'm wondering if anyone has any insights or interesting nuggets from their conversations that they want to share either in the chat or uh, jump in out loud. So our group, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> um, so our group, we didn't have the questions, so we just kind of talked. Um, and a couple of things that we came out with is that, you know, just using AI is not the devil's work. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that knowing when to use it. And for students, helping them understand when they could should be using it and what level they should be using it is really important. But even in our own work, because some of us have jobs where we pay to write things, <laughs> um, is to say, when is using it okay and like help me helping me speed along and when should I really be more focused on what I can do beyond the AI and the other bit that we also said just before we left was that maybe what you talked about at one point of having students kind of quote the AI they used so making them accountable say okay yeah you can use some this this and this but if you do you have to just mention it at the end by making them accountable for that, they can no longer say that they did it all on their own. And so maybe they will put more thought and be more genuine and authentic in their work. And so those are the kind of the two main stems of our discussions of, um, sure, it's a, yeah, why not? Let's use it. And in what context? And then let's make ourselves accountable for it. So that's great. Thanks. Yeah, that's an interesting point that if students uh, are required to create citations, then maybe that gives them a sense of when it might not be okay. Like if I feel bad about citing this or I, I'm not inclined to talk about my use of this tool, then maybe it's not a tool that I should be using. Um, I see in the chat, a suggestion was the AI appendix. Anytime students have used AI in writing a paper that they also su submit an, an appendix. I think that's great. Um, there are lots of folks on campus who are also including some reflection components. Um, to help students sort of think about if they're using AI, what did they think about that? Like, what was it like using that tool? And what did, how did they feel about the responses that they got? Why did they make just the decisions that they made um, in using it? Thanks for that. Any other insights or thoughts from the conversation? Brian, you want to mention from our group? Uh, Ellison, can I just say one one last one one thing? Sorry, uh, let's see. It, I guess it's not an observation. It's maybe a fear, and um, and let me just quote uh, quote Betsy here uh, from maybe a couple of years ago. You had a session about student engagement, and you said something like, "Students will show up where the party is." So basically, mm -hmm. if your course is you know manageable, and so I'm wondering. If I'm running a course in which I allow students to use AI tools, but then I request them to reflect on the use of AI, so building that additional uh, item into assignments, would they think, nah, I'm just going to go with the one where maybe I'm not allowed, so they will never find out, <laughs> but I don't have to deal with the extra burden of me acknowledging, doing a reflection piece. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, how should we balance this sort of workload? Because I have to admit, it's going to be extra burden on the student to add, even if it's a three liner or a short paragraph or a list of acknowledgement, it's going to be something in addition to the assignment. That's a great question. That's a great question. Uh, I guess... I guess I see that in a larger context, which is uh, something we've all been talking about uh, really since probably March or so, which which is this question, what does it look like to turn our materials upside down, right? I mean, uh, m many of us had to learn how to do a lot of different things during the pandemic to uh, up, essentially upend our teaching. I think this is Many of us are discovering similar in terms of how much learning we need to do to be able to um, accommodate some of these new questions and, and needs uh, from our students and, and from our own materials. And so I'm not sure this is this is a like add it in, like put it put it into the matrix. I think it's 
look at what's in the matrix and figure out sort of what can be removed or what can be modified or uh, how we move things around so that it's not net more, it's, um, it's net different, I guess. Uh, if, and that's obviously easy for me to say and very difficult for me to do. Um, but I think it's not about sort of, we need to add more stuff. I think it's about, we need to think critically about what goes, what goes in, how it goes in and how we, how we talk about it. Um, Betsy, I feel like, uh, did you have a comment? I thought Brian for our group might want to say something. Uh -huh. Oh, sure. So we talked about some things that have come up in other panels that we've been part of today. I think the grand verdict is that we're not going to come away from this week and with one hard and fast answer. There's a lot of issues at play. Mm -hmm. uh, but I really enjoyed earlier a panel where students spoke in favor kind of in a debate format of here's why I use AI and here's why I don't. And uh, one of the topics that was brought up was that there's value in struggle and that the time and effort expended in the human act of putting thoughts down on a page helps you organize your argument, uh, form your thoughts, form even your personality. And that that stands to be lost to a degree if uh, we turn everything over to AI. However, at the same time, you can't argue that it doesn't expedite the process. And so there are cases where it may behoove you to be able to turn out many responses quickly. Say if you are submitting many job applications and you it requires a cover letter perhaps, and you could submit the relative relevant information and have it organize that uh, and you know give it a pass over, but it may enable you to uh, be more productive in that regard. That's great. Thanks, Brian. Um, I want to end with um, a few, I, I guess a reminder, I'll put up the screen again, just so that this is, this is up there again, but uh, a reminder of these questions that I, I was trying really to uh, not just be specific to academic space, like classroom space, um, because I was also thinking of uh, the question that I posed at the beginning of the presentation, my own internal monologue question uh, of, of how I felt about using these tools. Um, the sort of audience awareness element, I think kind of touches on what you said a little bit, Brian. I think the notion that an audience might really care, it might really matter to my audience um, if the work is generated by me versus the, the, the work is generated or, or assisted even to this degree um, that some of Grammarly's capacities uh, represent. Um, it, it may, it may uh, affect the impact of my message, right? Um, so if we think about, um, I don't know, uh, if my if I apply for reappointment and promotion and the memo is written by a, a Grammarly assisted tool, I don't think I would like that. <laughs> if, uh, if my students um, received comments from me that were generated by uh, a generative AI tool, I'm not sure if my students would like that. Although I do know that there are faculty who are using tools in that way and have had some great success doing it, but I would say they're more creative and, and less and more nuanced than what I just what I just described. Um, but thinking about the the human requirement, what about this project is is human required? I think is a really important context question for students and any users of, of these tools. Um, the question of in uh, actually I'll just mention this first. Um, I'll have some resources for you and I'll point you to um, the Academic Integrity SharePoint page, which has a lot of resources and is gonna continue to grow. Um, MIT has a good subject guide uh, for citing AI. Um, so not just within Grammarly, but other uh, generative AI tools. Most of the major citation styles have now established citation guidelines for the use of generative AI tools. So I wanted to bring that up. Um, and I think this question just came up in the chat, which is, um, Will I be able to tell if my student uses Grammarly without permission? Um, and uh, you know, the the answer is like, well, ah, maybe, M maybe. I mean, here's here's a little example, and something's going to pop up on the screen in a second to tell you. Um, 
what's really going on here. Oops, sorry. Um, so this is language that was generated by Canva. And then I used Grammarly to edit it. And so this came with Canva's presentation template. Um, and it kind of like looks a little bit like what I'm talking about. Uh, and when I used Grammarly to edit it, I chose improve it. Uh, and so um, it kind of meets some of the requirements of this presentation to some extent. Um, but you can kind of see that it's like vague. It's pretty general. Obviously this is a template. So a lot of different people might be using it. And so it's not specific to what I'm talking about. And like the earlier Grammarly example, it's adding something else. Like I didn't put anything in about language learning, um, but the tool seems to have expanded when I suggested, when I asked it to improve it, it integrated that topic, which wasn't really in my text to begin, or wasn't really in my thinking uh, to begin with. Um, and uh, and it's using language that I didn't quite use. So um, like, obviously we're teachers, but I didn't really use the word teachers. I was using faculty or instructors. Um, and so sometimes we can identify the use of these tools because um, it's not as personalized as we're asking it to be, um, because it is vague, it's general. Uh, it's not um, incorporating ideas from the course or the texts or the discussions. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's really broad. Um, these aren't surefire, these aren't surefire ways um, of knowing for sure. And so my, the, the best advice I have is to get in front of it by giving clear uh, guidelines and instructions about what's okay and what's not okay. And more than just what's okay and what's not okay, why? Why is it okay to use this in this context and not in that context? Why is it not okay to use this in this context and in and instead in this context? Um, because that's what's gonna help you connect to your to your learning outcomes. So um, in, in my writing class, I don't want students to have Grammarly generate a brainstormed list of topics. I want my students to learn how to brainstorm. Invention is part of my, what I teach. Um, and so I don't want students to outsource that, that work to a, to a tool, any kind of tool. Um, and so being really specific about what kinds of tools, um, which components of those tools, like which features um, is better than giving broad statements to students like it's not permitted or it's encouraged. Um, what tools, which, which components within those tools um, and why. Bring up these questions about audience and context, integrate, uh, incorporate your learning outcomes into the statements that you're making, um, dig into these bigger topics, considering the ethical implications of the choices that students are making, um, incorporate process assignments and occasions for students to share their experiences in other ways. So not just um, in, in text submissions, but maybe presentations, um, conversations, uh, um, other other types of um, other types of assessments uh, that might help that might help students kind of show what they've learned and and apply it uh, in in different ways. Um, I did want to point you all to um, the Academic Integrity um, SharePoint site. Oops, sorry. Which is um, a, always a work in progress. I keep adding stuff to this faculty resources page. Um, and, uh, and I will keep adding. So if there are resources that you feel like you'd really like to see on that page, please, please let me know. Um, also it's a, um, you have to log in to access it with your AU credentials. Faculty can see a whole lot of other pages on the left-hand side. So information about what happens when you think you do have an issue and you need to get in touch with the Office of Academic Integrity about it, um, that, that helps you kind of um, go, through, go through that process. Um, and I see Betsy put in uh, her syllabus language. That's really helpful. There are examples of syllabus language all over this um, resources page from uh, examples of, um, of encouraged use of AI to strict use of AI. Um, you can look at different examples and different guidance for thinking about um, what, what you might do. Um, I've got a bunch of sources and references that I'll put up on the SharePoint page, but for now, um, I have a, 
a few that I'll that I'll point to. Um, MIT subject guide on citations I mentioned. Um, uh, Brian Alexander has a, a great article um, that compares this co comparison has come up a few times for us today. Um, generative AI is a calculate like a cal is like a calculator. Um, but he also argues that um, it's also kind of like a, a mad scientist sometimes where um, kind of like uh, the example I showed you where it was adding something uh, that I didn't create. Um, it wasn't just moving things around. It was um, doing some uh, creation work there. Um, and so this article is, uh, is really great. Um, a new inside higher ed piece is looking at um, uh, decision making. Um, in, in classrooms when it comes to AI. And then Anna Mills and Ethan Mollick are, are folks that have followed for a while that are um, doing both deep thinking about um, AI in higher education and also um, on the ground kind of suggestive work um, offering uh, ways to uh, incorporate um, AI into, into a classroom. Um, happy to share my slides. I will put them up on the SharePoint page. Um, I'll stop here and I can put the link to the SharePoint um, in, in the chat and I'll have those slides posted um, shortly. And I think the recording of this video will be available um, as well. And I can put the slides also up on the Ann Farron page. Um, I see we're bumping up against uh, time. If you have any questions, I'm happy to stick around, but you can always send me an email uh, at any time, uh, athomas at american.edu. Um, and I'm happy to talk through certainly any of these issues, but also uh, I hope everyone knows that if there are any academic integrity issues that pop up in the classroom at any time, uh, you can get in touch with our office. And I'll put my email in the chat too. Thank you. Nice to see everybody. Thanks, Allison. Very helpful. Thanks, Betsy. I hope you feel better. Thanks for your session this morning. It was great. Well, it's just, uh, I thought that webinar yesterday from AAC and you was the best I've been to. It was really good. I really liked um, the uh, Rothman's comments. I thought Michael those were, Roth. Yeah. yeah. Those were uh, Roth, was it? Um, he's were, he's oh. the president of a liberal arts college. Mm hmm. Yeah, he, like I really thought they were uh, sharp and insightful. I also thought, um, who's the other guy? Eddie. Eddie. Uh, his comments were really useful, especially, I mean, the AI detection tool comments. I was, uh, uh, I feel confident in our decisions about, the, about that, but to hear them echoed always um, feels really important to me. And my biggest takeaway is that, you know, we're just in this new world and we just have to embrace it. Yeah. And um, hopefully faculty will embrace it. Enough of us will embrace it so that we can figure out what we want to do. But in the interim, our students are way ahead of us on it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. The students' comments from this morning were super awesome. Uh, it was, I feel like uh, your student, Josh, really gave us a, uh, an interesting kind of umbrella for for the conference in some ways like the struggle comment was so um so sharp he and i've been talking all semester i did a whole interview with him took notes pushed it back at him he did a great job That's so awesome. oh, yeah. great. anyhow we can stop recording we can stop recording yes oh, yes <laughs>